morning. Uh, this is Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, we have our first agenda item is um, uh, the Department of Corrections with Jim Baker and Matt Diostino, the financial director. And I know I botched his name again, uh, which is not unusual. I've been doing that for 20 years or so. Um, but uh, Matt is uh, the financial head for the Department of Corrections. And we're going to be going over a few of the items in the corrections budget, mainly the ups and downs. But I'm also going to be asking the commissioner um, and Matt for ways to cut out-of-state beds to accomplish a $400,000 $400, savings to reestablish um, batter intervention programs in the community that we had before um, some budget cuts uh, a while back. And those batter intervention programs are very important. Um, with all the talk about other criminal activity, to me, uh, domestic violence remains the number one problem in Vermont. Um, secondly, um, and we've talked a little bit about this before, Jim, would be a two-year plan to upgrade correctional officers to a more um, professional. I, I know when I was first hired in corrections back, I won't even say the year, um, we were, I was hired as a correctional counselor, not a correctional officer. And there was a, there was a different attitude about that position. Um, we still had, you know, duties that involved incarceration and walk up and so forth, but we were seen as correctional counselors. <coughs> and finally, perhaps establishing with the Justice Oversight Committee and this committee um, next year, to your plan to eliminate out-of-state beds. So um, along with the Justice Reinvestment II effort. So those are my basic things. I know committee members may have other um, issues, but maybe we could start with the ups and downs in your budget and, uh, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> and just for the record, uh, I'm Commissioner Jim Baker, the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt um, to go do the ups and downs. And then uh, you, I'll follow up with the policy discussions that you brought up, Senator, and answer okay. any questions. Good morning, everyone. Um, no, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I have the ability okay. to share. Why don't we just kind of walk through them? Sure, certainly. I don't, I, as I, I did, I do remember seeing them. Um, it's just a matter of... Um, <clears throat> So of, of the seven appropriations for DOC, there's only three that have changes in the, in the FY21 restated budget. Uh, the first would be parole board. There is a um, about a $22,000 base reduction uh, to travel expenses. A uh, lot of reasons for this. There's been over the last couple of fiscal years, reductions in, in travel uh, in general. So this, this reduction effectively puts the operating budget more in line with what actual expenditures have been. Through the pandemic, of course, there's been a much more uh, reduced travel as well. And our our thought is that just not just parole board, but correctional services as well, which we'll see in a couple of minutes, that we are going to be able to effectively have Zoom meetings and the like and take advantage of these technologies rather than having folks driving all over the state, which isn't to say we won't still have in-person meetings and, and still have travel expenses. But we do anticipate that over the next couple of fiscal years, we'll probably see reductions um, that we perhaps wouldn't have otherwise seen had we not been living through the current environment of, of doing most of our, our meetings remotely. Um, the, next, the next item in terms of appropriations is the correctional services appropriation. We had a technical adjustment, which is um, for the th addition of the 30 new correctional officer positions that were added in the FY20 budget. This adjustment is a uh, net neutral. Um, it's general fund. It's about a $1.9 million increase to add those positions to our budget and an offsetting $1.9 million approximately decrease, um, which is related to the vacancy savings, overtime reductions, temporary staff savings, and the like that we'll see from those 30 new positions. Additionally, we have a $1.75 million reduction. Um, this is savings from the health services contract. This is not a reduction to those services. What this is, when the governor's FY21 budget was, was proposed back in January, um, we were not, DOC and the governor's office were not aware of 
what the cost of the new contract for health services would be. We were in the process of an RFP at that point, didn't have the financial information. The previous contract had a much higher per inmate per month cost associated with, with it. Um, there has been a substantial reduction in that per inmate per month cost. Again, it doesn't relate to the services themselves. They're still being delivered. There's been no reductions there. It's efficiency within those services where there's, there's been a cost decrease. So that, that $1,750,000 reduction is just the savings that we see from the contract we had that ended in June 30th versus the contract with Vital Core that began July 1st of this year. Okay. Um, the next item we have on the ups and downs is um, a $4,950,000 request. And this is for CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief Fund um, monies. That This is for largely staff that are substantially dedicated to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, mitigation and response efforts to that. DOC had, through the Joint Fiscal Committee, had approximately the same amount approved in FY20. Uh, we do anticipate through December 30th having expenses near $5 million, again, related to these efforts. Um, there are also funds and not related to this, this request, but for uh, personal protective equipment for other operating costs related to, to COVID response. As I mentioned with parole board, um, there's also a travel reduction in correctional services of $75,000. Um, this, this is potentially kind of the, the step one in terms of travel reduction. Again, during the pandemic, uh, the department is hosting a ton of, of meetings, but we're doing it remotely. Um, so there, there isn't as much in-state travel happening. Um, so there, there are some, some substantial savings we've seen for that. So there's a $75,000 travel reduction in the FY21 restated budget. Not hearing questions, I'll keep going, but please just stop me if there are. Um, we had also um, inter internal service funds, which we usually don't dive into too much in terms of the, the individual allocations, but nearly $600,000 $600, of reductions related to the internal service funds. Um, this was just base reductions to the, the cost that we'll see this year from the, the individual departments that build for things such as fee for space and, and um, digital service costs. And finally, in correctional services um, under our grants, in the proposed FY21 budget in January, we had looked at an adjustment for Medicaid earnings um, related to a community habilitative care program that's, that's long been um, funded with both general fund and global commitment funding. The hope was that we'd be able to leverage some additional Medicaid dollars to that and there was a 500 nearly five hundred twenty five thousand dollar reduction to general fund and an offsetting increase it was net neutral to the medicaid global commitment fund unfortunately we were our efforts continue in this um, but the pandemic has derailed those efforts slightly it's very unlikely that we'll be able to put the put the pieces together for medicaid billing uh, before the end of fy 21 so this this initial proposal of a $525,000 GF reduction has been effectively reversed in the restated budget. So there's, there's an increase to general fund of the 525 and the same decrease to the Medicaid global commitment. Again, this is something that we'll look at um, in FY21 as we, as we continue to move forward with it. Uh, the hope is that FY22, we'd be able to launch this and, and whether it's this amount or, or something less than that, that we'd be able to take advantage of some of those Medicaid funds for this program. And the last appropriation in terms of the restated budget that had adjustments is the out-of-state beds appropriation. Uh, this one was, was unique in terms of our the budget restatement. Everything that was in the initial FY21 budget effectively was reversed. So we, we in, in a sense, reverted back to the FY20 as past budget. So what we had was um, FY20, a, a budget that allowed for 225 beds out of state. And we had several, I'm um, seeing the note from Peggy that I might be able to share my screen. So I'm going to attempt to, to pull this up for everyone. Oh. 
Okay, great. But now I got to put my glasses on. I can see all of you, but not the screen. So hopefully you're looking at um, the out of state yep. appropriation no, first. No, we're fine. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so these, these first five items are, are again, just a reversal of those initial FY21 budget proposals. At this particular time, we're not able to increase US marshal beds in state, which would, which would increase the out of state beds by the same. Um, similarly, we had a, we had a proposal to um, increase the per diem cost for the marshals during the pandemic. These aren't conversations we've been able to have. So it's, it's unlikely that there'd be any changes in FY21 as well as filling the Caledonia work camp. So these, these have all been reversed. And there was, from the proposed budget you saw in January, this equated to about a $225,000 increase from that budget. Um, the proposal before us now is a reduction from the base appropriation of 225 beds down to 206 beds. So that's that, this final line, the, the $586,000 reduction. Yep. Yep. And uh, that, just for the committee, we're, we're currently at 219 beds today. Okay. And that that reduction is accomplished over the course of the rest of this fiscal year. So it's a it's an annualized uh, budget that 206 represents for for the full year. The and the the hope here is that when we we have 219 right now, so we're we've been slightly above that in the first quarter. Um, out of state caseload is always a challenge because we, of course, can't control the population. Um, right now, while there are some beds in state, we're, we're holding, you know, in terms of isolation, quarantine, all the COVID related needs. So we're not able to bring back necessarily as many as if we weren't going through a pandemic and had the population that we do now, um, it, it may, be, may be a little different view in terms of how many were out of state. Um, but the 206 does represent the, the budget for the entire fiscal year. Okay. On that, one area that I, there was some this, some brief discussion in Senate appropriations about the uh, community college, a uh, community high school of Vermont, um, and a shift from uh, general fund to education fund. Could, could I don't see that on here? No, this so this the restated budget only only includes the items that that were that were done after the initial budget. Um, okay. I've, I've, I've gone up to the education budget. And again, unfortunately, as you said, Senator Sears, there's, there's not, you can't see the movement here, but yeah. the, the funds were, the funds have, at least for the last couple of years, the funding for the school has largely been in general funds. There are some, some yeah. grants. So, so this uh, 100, nearly 150,000 in interdepartmental transfer, which is AOE grants. But the proposal in the FY21 original budget was to move the $3.3 million out of the general funds and then into the, the special funds, the education funds. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and we had discussions in Senate appropriations. I know it's been more controversial in the House, but it seems like at least for those under 21, um, and I don't know what population that is, who are in the community high school of Vermont, it would appear that they would have to if they were in the community would be the community would be, be required to provide them with an education. So I've always felt that at least for that group, um, that the ed, ed fund is appropriate, but I know there's been a battle between the house and Senate and DOC for years predates, um, commissioner, ba interim commissioner Baker, who by the way has lasted longer as an interim commissioner than many commissioners in the 50 states. <laughs> I, I, uh, it's, I appreciate that observation, Senator. Um, Senator, on, on the issue of the high school and the education fund, it is, you know, we did, we did hear in the House both appropriations and House corrections and institutions about their concerns. And what I will tell you is that we have a conversation going on now, taking a healthy look at the way we deliver that um, educational piece inside the facilities. Because the reality of it is that as the population has changed, we don't have a whole, we don't have many numbers under 21 that are participating in that. And uh, what we're talking about right now is, and hopefully, um, by the time we come back to start talking about 22, 
uh, we'll, we'll have at least a framework of an idea of how we're going to look at that educational piece moving forward. Because the original idea, quite honestly, um, because of the age of, of, of the folks and their abilities around uh, basic English and, and uh, math and so on, um, is challenged. Um, we're trying to find a, what we hope would be a more successful model than what we have right now. So there's going to be more conversations about that. I wonder if, the, if committee members have any questions for Matt or Commissioner Baker about the uh, the budget. And Peggy, you could take that down now, I think, or whoever's got it on the screen so that we can see everybody. I have a question. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, uh, maybe I forgot what I was going to say, but, you know, there's always been that concern about the people up to 21. And I think previously they were not, they were not sent out of state if they didn't have a high school diploma because they would then, they were then required to be in school. And I don't know if that's still going on, wondering if it is. Not sending them out of state? Correct. Correct. And again, I don't have the number right here in front of me. I should have brought it with me, but um, we, we have very few people 21 and under in our system, right? That are serving sentences um, just because of the nature of the criminal justice reform effort, right? So <clears throat> that population shrunk significantly. So I believe the value of the way we're structured now has to be, uh, isn't hitting the mark. So we have to look at it uh -huh. um, and still afford and that, when we get to that conversation, it's going to be, you know, 21 won't matter. Uh, 25, trying to get people set up for yep. basic educational stuff that will prepare them for work transition to the community mm -hmm. is going to, you know, is what we're talking about being the focus. I think we got about 20 minutes left. Yeah. I wonder if we could go to the um, things that I mentioned and maybe other committee members have issues that they'd also like to discuss. Senator, do you want to start with the out-of-state beds? Yeah. So, and how we uh, can get 400,000 additional out-of-state yeah. out right. beds to, to fund the um, community-based domestic violence batterer programs. Let me say, you know, it's hard to make that commitment right here, but what I'll say to you is we'll come back with a plan for you on that, on how to find that 400,000. And that's for I appreciate that. And well, nine, and we're, in con we're in conversations with Karen about this uh, because of um, our proposed work with David Kennedy out of John Jay, creating that focus deterrence on high risk uh, intimate partner violators. Um, you know, uh, we're focused on that. But I, I will say to you, we have nine more people coming back on September 15th. That'll put our population at 210. So we're, you know, we're moving towards that 200 number uh, just to, to make sure we balance out for the fiscal year to hit our numbers. But I think what I would like to do, I've heard you, uh, Matt and I will come back um, sometime towards the end of next week with how, how we could potentially find that money. That's, that's fine, maybe. I, I will just say we can go directly to the, um, to the uh, Senate appropriations and the uh, okay. and, and joint fiscal office. So. Got it. Uh, Matt and I will talk about that and we'll get back to you. Great. Any comments from the committee on this? Senator White, you're muted. This isn't, the, this isn't a comment on this necessarily, but I'm getting, um, can I change the topic a little bit here, Senator Sears? Yep. Okay. So I'm getting a lot of um, emails as I'm sure we all are that are asking us to um, follow the ACLU's um, guidance and cut our prison population by 50%. And I know we've already cut it, um, been working on that for years. I wonder if, if you could uh, forward to us, I probably have it somewhere in my desk up there, the, the kinds of people that currently are in prison, what the the, the, you did a breakdown for us once before about whether they were violent felonies, nonviolent felonies. And I wonder if you could forward that again to us. I, I, I will, Senator. We'll get that. 
We'll get it to you next week after a holiday. Okay, thank you. And, and I'll, I'll get it forwarded to the whole committee and then also it'll probably be a good thing for joint justice to have as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, I, if I might just comment very briefly on that. Um, one of the things we found through using our system of justice oversight, excuse me, justice reinvestment, um, we have seen a decrease of about 750 beds incarcerated and no uptick and actually a reduction in crime rates. Um, and I am fearful any plan that says we're going to reduce by a certain percentage without taking into account making sure that we both protect the public and don't have an uptick in crime rates um, and that that is done in a logical um, thoughtful manner. So I'm fine with having a goal of, of reducing another 200 by in the next two years um, to eliminate the out-of-state beds, but to suggest that we can cut another 50% out um, could endanger public safety. And I think that we have to keep that in mind. And so your request is a good one, Senator, because I think we, we need to let the public know um, who is incarcerated in Vermont? You know, I got a lot of letters um, to take all the people who are incarcerated for possession of marijuana or under two ounces out of jail. And that would be a very easy thing to accomplish because there's nobody there That's right. um, for just that offense. So, you know, when you, uh, I mean, the public perceives certain things that we've locked people up who are um, not dangerous. And we may have, and we may have a few that, um, that, that should be continued to be released. I think you have to do it in a methodical fashion. And that's what really what Justice Reinvestment 2 is all about. So sorry for my soapbox, but thank you for bringing that up, Senator. It would be helpful to all of us, I think all 180 legislators, to have that information, Jim, so that they can yeah. respond to constituents who are... Um, yeah, and I, I don't mean to cut into the, the committee conversation, Senator, but, but you know this and I know everybody knows this. When that conversation comes up, I, I just have to say this. Sometimes we don't take into consideration the victims of the crimes. Um, the the yeah. other. Yeah, I, I just, Senator, if I can just finish. One of the things that we've seen as we've tried to thin out the population during COVID is we've had, we've had a little bit of a, I don't want to even call it an uptick, but we've had some serious domestic assault cases of prior intimate partner abusers um, when we've released them on furlough. And, you know, again, I'm very dialed into the needs of victims. That's part of our responsibility at correction. So, sorry, Senator. Thank you. Senator White. I, I didn't mean to, I thought, I didn't mean to interrupt your thought there, but the other thing that would be helpful with that is the kind of the, how we changed the trajectory of what was anticipated that we would have incarcerated if we kept on. And just because I think that people um, don't know that we have actually reduced, reduced the number, both from what was projected and from the real number. So just a, a little graph with that or some, just some. We, we actually have that at the Justice Center did that. And uh, there is the projection. It looks at the projection and then where we were, I think, in 2018 um, in terms of population. And I believe the actual numbers were about 700, but the projected numbers were almost 1,000 yeah. reduction from what was projected to grow if we hadn't done justice for investment one. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. And the savings, the savings in, un, uh, you know, in costs have been humongous. Um, when you think about the cost of in incarcerating a thousand people. Thanks. So, so Senator, also to add to that is, you know, our population sneaking up again, 1424 today, 379 detainees, minus about 60, 65 federal detainees there. And um, it's really starting to put pressure on us around managing our COVID. Because right now in Vermont, I'm, I'm about, as of the beginning of the week, I was minus seven beds. Uh, I had seven beds that have cut into our quarantine medical isolation beds to manage COVID. So again, I just, I have to say that because that pressure, that pressure on us is real. 
And so uh, that, that puts a lot of pressure on us to manage COVID. <clears throat> Senator White. Yeah. So that um, brings up another, another question that I wasn't sure if I was gonna ask or not, but when we, um, in government operations, when we talked to Commissioner Sherling um, and to the VSEA, one of the things that came up was that in corrections, there was a lack of PPE. And that, um, and I don't know how long ago. Lack of what? The per personal protection. Equipment. Oh, okay, thank you. And um, the, and the uh, commissioner said that they were working on that with you, that they had a plan because you purchased from two different places. And I just wondered if we, we actually now have enough um, PPEs for all the, the guards and the prisoners. Yeah, so, so that conversation, I wasn't part of that, but I did follow up on that afterwards, Senator. And where, um, look, I, I, don't, I don't care what anybody tells you. We've been dealing with this since March. PPE is still hard to find. Uh, you know, the State Operation, Emergency Operations Center is, is one source of PPE. And they're serving the bigger population, include medical, nursing homes. Early on, we made the decision to go on our own, and we created our own logistic supply line, as I've briefed committees before. There is still certain things that are hard to get our hands on, and some of the bureaucracy slows us down. Um, I'll give you an example. We located 20,000 N95 masks that we wanted to purchase, and the bureaucracy, before we could get through the bureaucracy, of the purchasing process, um, 18,000 of those masks were gone. Um, so we've been on our own. It's not a reflection on what's happening in public safety. But for example, I think where the union was concerned is that we had to make homemade gowns. Yes. On the plat Look, I get it. It sounds terrible when they say they're wearing garbage bags or not. But if that's the only place that I can protect them, and that's how I have to protect them, that's where I'm going you still have a hard time finding medical gowns right now on the open market. And so, you know, I think that's where that conversation came up and the union has been concerned for a while. And I've heard it in labor management several times. So as I sit here right now, we have, um, I think the number that I heard the other day is that we, we probably have uh, three months worth of supplies. And yes, we still have plastic gowns that we're using to protect our staff. We did get about 600 gallons, I think is the number, from the State Emergency Operations Center, um, but it's still challenging. I think they're around 50 days of supplies. Now that sounds like a lot. If another round of COVID hits us in September and October, that will disappear in a hurry. It's challenging finding PPE. We work at it every single day inside corrections. So when you, when you talked about the, the bureaucracy, being an impediment to getting it. Were you talking about our bureaucracy in, in the state at the state level here through um, either BGS or some other? Um, I, I, I am. And how can we solve that? Well, I, I think, you know, again, in fairness, I know Matt's working with them right now. Um, look, we have to realize that um, following normal course of business during this pandemic has got to change. And that's just one small example of it. You know, we've had to make drastic changes in corrections. So um, we are working on that with them, but I'm using that as an example because it's easy to say that we don't have the PPE, but I have three staff members that work full-time. All they do is supply the supply line um, to include cleaning supplies, masks, gloves. Finding plat rubber gloves was a challenge for a while. We actually took it, we actually got for, for, for the inmates cleaning crews, we actually got some donations for that stuff. So it's a challenge every day. Um, we work at it every day and we're paying more money than we probably ought to be paying for some of this stuff, but we're paying it because we need it, if that makes sense. If I could find, if I could find 5,000 medical gowns, I'd buy them tomorrow. Thank you. Well, BGS is under our jurisdiction, so maybe, or under Joe's and ours, so purchasing is under, um, it's within government operations, so maybe we'll talk to them. Yeah, and again, I, you know, it's no one's fault. It's just the process. No, no. Right? That's, no, that's I, the point. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 uh, I, I belabored that a little bit. Sorry, Senator Sears. No, I wanted to get on to the to the other two issues with the, 
about five minutes we've got left because I really have to get yep. uh, Mike Sherling and Matt Birmingham in here to. Um, well, you to can talk always about. give me some of their money, Senator, for correction yep. from my friends from the state. Well, we could. I, I think Sherling has a, a wealth of, of money that he's sitting on. Um, I've heard that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about um, the corrections officers and how to upgrade um, their um, professionalism. And uh, I know that you support that effort, but I'd really like to see it on paper as a goal for, this, for the state of Vermont to work towards that. Um, yep. you know, I, yeah, I agree, Senator. I, and I, we have some ideas um, for potentially a legislative package in January to come forward. Okay. Uh, it'd be premature. I know um, I, I've talked quite a bit with House Corrections and Institutions Representative Edmonds. She's starting to take some testimony now about um, equity and fairness in the system and data gathering and where we are in that process. And um, I, I think she's looking also to do something on the House side as well. So I'm hoping once we get past the, the, the 21 budget here, we can get something on paper for consideration around uh, working collectively on how do we get there. Well, the current system is ripe for burnout amongst good correctional officers. Absolutely. And um, it, absolutely, we, we need to be able to keep those who are interested in the field um, and keep them in a very, I mean, it's a difficult job. It's, but, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very challenging job. And so I think we need to do a better job of professionalizing it and upgrading the salaries, upgrading the, um, the training and, and professionalism. Because um, I've met some people that are amazing who are mm -hmm. correctional officers, mm -hmm. who are dedicated, who are working double shifts, or one and a quarter shifts, or one and a half shifts a day, 12 hours a day in a very difficult situation. And in the middle of a pandemic, you really see those that are dedicated, but in many ways, they're getting um, more and more pressure uh, on them uh, from both families and others to say, you know, That's hey, great. wait a minute, you're in a, you know, you're, you're in a vulnerable position. And then, then you come back home and you've got, you know, family and so forth that, uh, so I think, I think um, you know, we really need to recognize those folks and begin a process of um, upgrading. So, Senator, on Tuesday of this, this week, we did a presentation to um, uh, the entire um, Human Resources Department, including the commissioner, <clears throat> on a proposed hiring process that I've been talking about since I've gotten here. We're close to implementing that. It's, it's a data-driven look. And here's to your point. We're losing about 15 employees a month. Oh my God. Most of them are corrections officers. And most of them are self-selecting out. It's not like they're, they've reached their retirement, they're leaving. They're self-selecting out. We, we have a retention problem that we have to address. And so if you, if you do the math on that, and uh, I cannot possibly keep hiring to keep up with the, with the, uh, with the attrition. So we've got to find a way, just like you said, to um, we're like on a treadmill. We're well past pushing the button to 10 and we're running as fast as we can. We're going nowhere on this. It's adding all kinds of chaos inside the organization. And we have to figure this out <clears throat> because that burnout rate, because again, even though you've heard me talk about challenges around personnel actions, the vast majority of the correctional staff are the most caring, hardworking folks you want to and they're working under very difficult situations. To be in PPE all day long with masks during hot summertime, it's been brutal. And then you get mandatory overtime on top of it. You know, we're trying to support them the best we can. We brought a full-time clinician on. I shared this with HR the other day. Since we brought the clinician on, our clinician has brought two to three employees back from the brink, and I mean from the brink. And. Uh, so this is a real challenge for us. And I think with working with the legislature, we have an opportunity um, once and for all, not only culturally to change internally inside corrections, but culturally the way folks look at corrections from the outside. 
right? I mean, we're at the other end of the criminal justice system and sometimes people just don't understand what we do and how hard people work. And I think that recognition of changing that culture, the way folks are looked at, I don't mean to correct anybody here, but you know, referring to them as guards is part of the old, the old, the old cultural mentality. They're not guards. They're, there's a reason why they're called correctional officers, because our goal should be and our focus should be is correcting and modifying behavior so folks can become successful in life. I'm going to suggest that you look back to the original concept of the St. Albans prison um, as kind of a guide. People had it back then. It was another reform era. And I think we quickly moved away from it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, you know, times change, uh, administrations change, but you can look back to some of that. And there was a real effort then for professionalism. I, now, I will that. say that the salary that we received was not commensurate with the, <laughs> even no, no. back, back no. then. But, you know, it, <laughs> But I, I think there was at least a, a recognition of the need to have a more professional uh, recognition of these folks who are doing some tremendous work inside. Yeah, it is. And again, so, the stated mission of what the department is, we're, you know, the mission statement we're operating with is 20 plus years old. Yeah. So I think, that, um, I'm sorry to have to cut this off. It's been That's a fine. good conversation, Commissioner. I do want to hear from Mike Sherling, and since you mentioned that he's got a lot of money, um, I know that the um, Senate Government Operations Committee heard from Mike, but they didn't make any recommendations for major reductions to be sent over to correction, so they must have missed all that money that he's got. I don't know what that's all about, Senator. So. We, we did. Actually, we, missed, we missed it. Sorry about that. We'll, we'll have him come back in and look at his budget again. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's it's Colonel Birmingham. Check his wallet. Yeah, I mean that's that's where. <laughs> right, Ooh. right. Well, we noticed that whenever he's on, he no, he doesn't show his face. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you, Matt. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your support. We're going to follow up with you, Senator, and the committee to okay. get that information back. And and right. uh, I think um, in in a couple of weeks, having a conversation about um, what can it look like in January as we move towards raising that bar and. Changing. The I just remind you that, but that's about all we have left as a company. I know, I know, but I think I think yeah. the package we'll put together will be for January. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we can have work it out with Bryn and, and Stephanie to have it Correct. Uh, updated Correct. to the Justice Oversight Committee. Correct. Great. Thank you very much to both of you, and have a great Labor Day weekend. Oh, same to all of you. Take sure. care. Thank you. Uh, it might see Mike Sherling is, is on deck. Um, well, in more ways than one, he's on deck. Um, I, I didn't mean to put it that way. Yeah, I think Matt Birmingham's on the phone. That is correct, Senator. I'm here. Yeah. I really wanted, uh, since I knew government operation had gone over your budget, I really wanted to focus on your uh, modernization effort for uh, 20th, 21st century policing and to get some of your ideas. I know you've only got about a half an hour to spend with us, um, but um, we'd like to get an update on that. And uh, despite Colonel Baker's, um, excuse me, not Colonel Baker, Commissioner Baker's um, thinking about all your money that you've got, um, I know government operations will take another look at that. I've got at least uh, $7.18 for you, Senator. <laughs> maybe as many as eight dollars all right uh thanks for uh thanks for having us in uh for the record uh michael Sherling, commissioner of uh public safety and uh there's a wide array of things we could go over in the next half hour so maybe just uh, i'll spend five minutes talking about the evolution of the modernization strategy and then at uh, your discretion senator we can go into detail on whichever components you'd like yep. that sounds good um, in, uh, in January, uh, we put forth, uh, actually what you, the document that you've, you've got here, we're, we're hoping to update this in the, in the next few weeks, but the, the pace has been uh, a little brisk and we've been developing other documents. So we've got to kind of combine those to create a, a cogent roadmap of all the things that are going on right now. Um, but it, 
on that document, you'll see five areas of, of priority. Uh, I'll note for the record that the fifth one in the modernization of corrections facilities was something we discussed at length uh, with Commissioner Touchette. And uh, since Commissioner Baker's been here, uh, COVID has been the primary topic. So we haven't had a lot of time uh, to revisit that under his leadership. So I just wanted to flag that for you. Um, essentially, we're working to try to simplify the delivery models to the greatest extent possible, especially as it relates to unifying uh, information technology uh, and um, more in the last uh, few months, uh, policy initiatives uh, around operational standards statewide. Um, we have uh, the framework uh, uh, of ideas around modernizing training uh, for law enforcement, in particular, the methodologies that could be used by the Criminal Justice Training Council to deliver both basic training, but also um, in-service training statewide. And not only for law enforcement, but for public safety in general, how do we combine some of the efforts that are going on in emergency, ser emergency medical services, uh, in emergency operations, which is in our purview in public safety and, and the fire uh, academy and the fire service. We think there's some opportunities there to cross pollinate uh, some of those uh, training opportunities and platform and delivery platforms. Of note there, we are on the precipice of hiring a new executive director for the Criminal Justice Training Council. Uh, that is in its very final stages of uh, background uh, investigation and, and negotiation with the candidate. Uh, so that's coming in the, in the near term. That process was uh, a very inclusive one that uh, involved uh, 20 stakeholders from inside and outside uh, state government. Um, the third component is uh, a modern foundation for criminal justice data collection and analysis. And you've heard us talk about this in the past, uh, a unified computer aided dispatch and records management system that allows for real time collection of information and as close to real time reporting of information as possible, uh, both using interactive dashboards that are easy to navigate for the public, for legislators, for policymakers uh, and others but also uh, making raw data available as quickly as possible on a 60 to 90 day window rather than a 12 to 15 month window so that folks outside of government uh, can inquire of that data, ask questions that we haven't thought to ask and come up with ideas and, uh, and solutions that we might not even have in our, uh, in our field of view at any given time. Um, and then uh, the fourth component is uh, to standardize and deliver alternative justice off ramps. Um, that includes embedded social workers and mental health clinicians, which is a, a, a very uh, timely topic right now. Uh, as you probably know, we've uh, budgeted for seven additional mental health clinicians or mental health workers more accurately uh, in our budget um, for fiscal 21 to increase the number of barracks and more accurately service areas around barracks, not just the the service areas that state police respond to, but that entire service area that have access to uh, field um, mental health first response and proactive response. Uh, and that's in, those services are available currently in two barracks and then sporadically in a variety of areas around Vermont through uh, different parallel programs. Uh, and finally, um, modernizing corrections facilities to, is, a, is a whole other topic that again, I, I think it would be uh, premature for us to go into greater detail there uh, without um, without involving uh, Commissioner Baker, which we've just frankly haven't had a chance to get into the weeds on that recently. Um, among the components uh, in our strategy are uh, some budget stabilization, uh, which we've talked at length with our committees of uh, our budget committees and committees of jurisdiction about, um, or in, in particular the government operations committees. Uh, early in the session, so that is, is almost ancient history at this point. Uh, additionally, uh, we've looked back at a couple of dozen reports that have been authored over the last 50 years, and we've taken what we think are the, the best thinking that matches the 21st century environment from them. Um, and uh, we've put forth it also in response to legislation that has been introduced around an agency of public safety, and that's been introduced multiple times uh, over the last decade or so. Um, in response to that and in, uh, and in keeping with many of the recommendations that have been made over the last five decades, we put forth an outline of what an agency of public safety could look like. Uh, and there's some detail, uh, preliminary detail around that that's available. Um, 
there's a draft organizational structure in here, uh, an outline of benefits. Um, and then uh, probably the other area that I want to highlight is uh, how uh, we in state government and in the Department of Public Safety in particular support statewide public safety efforts. Uh, and those go to uh, the, the, the training realm that I just mentioned, uh, how we do a, 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 how we enhance the already good work that's going on there. Um, how we do our uh, communications infrastructure and our um, information technology. And those are two topics that are uh, top of mind right now, in part because we're in the final stages of selecting a computer-aided dispatch and records management system. And we're also modernizing the connectivity model that allows public safety organizations to connect to us, all in hopes of dramatically reducing the cost of operation to both the state but also to municipal and county government that connects to us. Essentially where we're going is to try to eliminate the costs associated with their connectivity by eliminating hardware, uh, hundreds of hardware devices that we have to pay to maintain, going to a software security model and delivering a statewide computer aided dispatch and records management system at no charge to municipalities and, and other entities. Um, in large part, because it makes sense for the state to be able to aggregate data uh, and report that data out to all Vermonters uh, without having uh, to do that on a case-by-case -case basis across dozens, if not hundreds, of public safety organizations. Um, so that's the, the technology vision. And then you may have uh, begun, well, this started in back in December, but uh, I'm sure folks have heard uh, a piece at a time about uh, the transition to uh, billing for dispatch services um, in a nutshell that is not designed to be a money maker uh, so that we can shift more dollars back over to Commissioner Baker or into our budget. Uh, it's just a balancing of uh, the scale so that Vermonters are all paying uh, on an equal footing uh, for the emergency communication services. As you're aware, there are three ways that dispatch services are delivered in Vermont. You either have your own dispatch facility, you contract with someone, or then there are a hundred or so agencies that get free services from the two state operated public safety answering points. And that creates disparity in cost for all taxpayers. Essentially, uh, all taxpayers are subsidizing the hundred agencies that get services from us. Meanwhile, some of those taxpayers are paying again to get dispatch services in their municipality or county if they have a different dispatch model. So all we're suggesting is that we level that uh, playing field uh, so that everyone's paying a little bit. Uh, it's not a moneymaker if, uh, if the agencies that are with us now decide to go to another PSAP because it's more cost effective or it meets their needs better, that's fine. We're not, we're not looking to try to generate dollars uh, as a result uh, of that initiative. And I, I could talk at length about any one of these things. Uh, I'll just add that um, there are some more nuanced strategies in another document that I know you've seen and that we forwarded a, 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 the newest version of, which is the 10 point um, sort of equity in law enforcement, fair and impartial policing strategy, everything from training to, uh, uh, to hiring, uh, to community oversight models, uh, investigatory models, et cetera. Uh, the, probably the most important nugget at the center of all of that is trying uh, at last to bring uniformity and consistency to the way all of those things are done statewide from one tip to the other so that we're not doing it 70 or 80 different ways uh, on the key topics. Uh, not that every municipality should be operating exactly the same way or every county should be operating the same way or that even every um, state law enforcement agency should be operating exactly the same way. But on key topics, how we hire, how we train, how we promote, how we select chief executives, um, how we have th the fact that we should have a transparent community oversight system. All of those things should by and large be in the same general lane of travel. And that's what that document represents as an outline of effort to go in that direction. So with that, I talked more than five minutes and. Uh, well, uh, you did, but that's okay. Um, and I wanted to um, focus on, on, um, one area and then I'm sure committee members have other questions or comments. Um, interestingly, I'm just looking at an email from Paul Doucette, the chief of police in Bennington, um, asking uh, what they could do to get, if there are any grants available to provide a crisis worker to support the Bennington community 
um, by responding to crisis calls alongside members of the department. Um, and perhaps Colonel Birmingham or yourself could get in touch with the chief to let them know what this plan is and how it might work. Um, obviously, I don't know of any grant money right now, but it's certainly something that might be desirable for those communities that want to try to uh, establish a crisis unit. And then looking at what happened in Rochester, New York, um, when certainly um, the naked man in the middle of the street um, that their family called for help who ended up dying um, certainly calls for the need for that type of crisis worker. Um, and fortunately in Vermont, we haven't had, fortunately in Vermont, we have had efforts, but they've been minimal to deal with the mental health crisis that many people are going through and then end up being dealt with by the criminal justice system, starting with police, you know, the local police, state police or whatever, then eventually into the correction system as a detainee. And because there's no place to go, appropriate place, they end up staying longer than other detainees. So it just adds to that problem. And I think we need an overall. I, I know that the Justice Center, Council State Government's Justice Center has a plan, but it's based on counties for, it's called the Stepping Up Initiative to, to find alternatives for those mental health crises. I don't know if you've seen that initiative, um, but again, it's based on counties and we don't have a county government here for that. But I wonder if you could comment a little more on this alternative, this idea of the seven embedded social workers, how they would help local police and others. Or sure. maybe uh, and wants to enter into that too. That's a great question, Senator. As a segue into that, I'll also mention that at the uh, at the tail end of our modernization strategy, we put forth a criminal justice and community health system modernization model that's designed to address exactly what you're describing, uh, that a resource invested earlier on in a crisis, whether that's criminogenic, it's mental health, it's substance abuse, or often co-occurring disorders, all of those things uh, crashing together in someone's life, um, that education and prevention are the most, uh, that's the most impactful dollar. And then outreach and intervention, the types of things that we're talking about with these embedded workers. Um, I, sh I should stop calling them embedded. We had some feedback yesterday from another committee that said that was a, a difficult word, but um, partnering with mental health uh, providers to provide field service, um, that outreach and intervention at the earliest possible moment so that things don't continue to devolve into a, a more substantial crisis uh, is the next best dollar spent. And then after that, alternative sanctions, which I know, Senator, you've been uh, deeply involved in, whether that's restorative justice, our shift to municipal and civil ticketing, uh, traditional court diversion, reparative boards, those kinds of things are all critical tools in the toolbox. And then we reserve uh, the resources of courts and corrections only for those who were not able uh, to put on to some other off-ramp earlier in the system. So the mental health uh, expansion is envisioned to be for all organizations uh, within a, a service area, not just, for example, in, in the barracks uh, that covers uh, Bennington, uh, the Bennington Police Department would be able to access those services from that worker. Important to note that right out of the gate, we're talking about only one person uh, per barrack, so a, a little bit limited in the amount of time that can be covered and the, the total number of people they can interact with. But the overarching goal is to sort of break the log jam that's existed here. Uh, we've been talking about deploying these workers for years. The model that's been put forth previously has always started with blended investment. State puts in some dollars, uh, municipalities put in some dollars, healthcare system puts in some dollars, service providers put in some dollars, and then we deploy the, the services. What we're suggesting is let's not wait to build those coalitions because budget pressures for everyone are always top of mind. Let's invest the dollars, start that program everywhere, and then by demonstration of the efficacy of the results, we bring people to the table to co-invest and then expand those programs statewide. The other notable thing is that um, We've got a variety of these that operate statewide now. We've got two in barracks, but they operate independent of one another. The goal is to create almost a statewide team of people 
that while they may not be employed in the same place and they may not be um, doing exactly the same thing in every location because the nuances of each county or municipality might be a little bit different, that you've got a, a functioning multidisciplinary team similar to our SIUs that is constantly thinking about training and sharing experience to improve response on a statewide basis. So that's the, that's the overarching uh, vision. Um, you'll note in one of our documents that we originally uh, had put forth uh, in our budget that we would pay for two positions, corrections would pay for two and mental health, uh, de Department of Mental Health would pay for two. COVID pressures have kind of blown up everyone's budget but we, yep. were, um, we were able to um, add priority to this and, uh, and put forth the budget that the, or the budget committee see, which has got the seven workers in addition to the two uh, that are in service now. Great. Sorry, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted. Actually, I just wanna say to you, the quicker we get here, get there, the better off we'll all be. And, and in our prior conversation with Commissioner Baker about reducing out-of-state beds, one of the ways you do that is by reducing the number of people that are held on detention. And many of those people are in the situations that you just discussed. So the quicker we get this on the ground and up and running, the better off we'll all be. Um, I've got to take are, a short uh, break for myself. So Senator Nick, could you take over for a minute? You're muted, Senator Nick. Yes. Yes, I can. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be right back. Thank you, Commissioner. Can I ask a Thank question you. or yes. make a comment? Go ahead, Jeanette. So I think, um, Commissioner, you did not um, particularly mention, I don't think, unless I missed it, the, um, the hiring of Aton and how that is going to um, hopefully um, move us in the right direction. And I think the committee might be interested in that. Yes, a great point. Um, so embedded in the um, in the work around fair and impartial policing, and really ex accelerating um, uh, several years worth of work that's already um, been done, and, and a great foundation that's been laid. Um, we have brought on uh, Aton as a uh, co-director of fair and impartial policing, alongside Captain Gary Scott, who's been doing it for several years. Uh, unfortunately, Captain Scott will be retiring later this year. Uh, Captain Julie Scribner will be taking over as the co-director. There have been some questions in the last few days uh, or last day or so around um, whether we jump the gun on hiring uh, Aton without having uh, the legislature approve the budget request for it. I just want to clarify for folks while we're on the, uh, the line that we, he's been hired in, as a uh, temporary position, uh, temporary part-time uh, using our existing budget, and we're, we're suggesting in the budget we've submitted to you is that we memorialize that uh, as a line item uh, in the budget to move to continue to move it forward, so it's not just temporary. Um, but his wealth of experience, uh, having chaired RDAP and the uh, Fair and Impartial Policing Committee for years, um, is is an incredible asset uh, alongside the work that's already being done um, to do community engagement to help uh, us craft. Uh, strategy and policy. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, really trying to get a lot of this work into the, the main lane of travel so that it is uh, consistent across the entire state. And that's, those are the, the key roles uh, we see for him. And I, I may have left something out there that I would defer to the Colonel on. Um, I th no, I think that's it, Commissioner. I think, um, you know, the state police has a, uh, a long and, and positive um, history with um, Aton and uh, to bring him on board in this co-director position is uh, incredibly important for us. He will be there to one, help guide us, um, but also to bridge the, the community um, divide that may exist and does exist between communities of color and marginalized communities and sworn law enforcement officers. Um, so it's, his addition in, in that role is, is going to be very important for us. Good. Jeanette, did you, did you have something else? No, no, I was just, thank you. I just thought that was important to mention. Sounds good. Uh, anybody else? What else do we have that we wanted to discuss here? I hadn't, I don't have my agenda. Is anybody, did you have other things, uh, Colonel Birmingham or Mike, that you want to let us know about? 
Um, it may make sense just to, to flag for the committee. Uh, I, I know you probably know this, but uh, there's a lot of work being done on S-119 right now. And uh, we really uh, are very much uh, interested in ensuring that there is the requisite level of accountability uh, and the right uh, policy standards for use of force statewide going forward. Again, part and parcel of the, the plans that we've put forward so far, and we continue to actively work on. We do have some concerns about uh, a statutory overlay for that, that uh, we really want to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking with you about. And I also understand um, from various committee testimony that's happened in the last week that there have been uh, questions about scenario kinds of things. What if, what happens if uh, under a statutory construct as has been um, put forth. And um, I can't stress enough that uh, the number of variables in the scenarios are, are innumerable. And we would love to spend some time talking through various scenarios uh, of different types uh, to ensure that you've got accurate information. Uh, I think uh, you've heard from a variety of people um, with varying backgrounds and they've done their best to try to illuminate through their lens what it means uh, but i would submit that uh, a, some cross-section of what you heard um, is not reflective of how this will actually operationalize both the challenges and advantages uh, going forward so i think um, that's just a, a flag for the committee that there's a lot of exploration um, and a lot of depth that i think we'd like to put into this conversation uh, when possible Okay. Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering, you um, asked about the need for a lot of depth, a lot of conversation. Is that a way of saying that you think we should hold off on passing 119 in this short session? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, I mean, obviously that's in your purview, but I, I I think there's a large cross section of information that is missing from the conversation right now. Um, this is the most complicated area of criminal law that exists. And there are people who have written literally treatises, multi volume treatises on search and seizure, which the use of force is a seizure. It's a seizure of a person. Um, this is the most well-formed area of the law in police operations. And I think we just need an opportunity to explain all of that to the greatest extent possible uh, so that you can make informed decisions about where to go. And, and that's really hard to do on a short timeline. And it's really hard to do, frankly, in, in half hour or 45 minute snippets. This is, these are dozens of hours of training, um, mm -hmm. hundreds of hours of training over the course of several years to, to really become proficient uh, for police officers. So um, it's, a, it's a tall order to get um, to get folks up to speed on, on all the nuances. Um, it, I don't mean to sound like I'm trying to delay progress. We are simultaneously working um, on the same issue on a parallel track, uh, moving toward a statewide policy to memorialize the best practice as well. So we're not trying to handbrake um, progress here. It's just there are potential downsides to the statutory overlay that could have wide ranging cascading effects, uh, both to our inability to train, I guess high level, there's two primary areas of concern. Uh, creating a statutory construct will actually create more ambiguity for us because we will not know how to train for probably upwards of a decade until the courts give us an interpretation of what your words mean. Um, that is just standard with any new uh, piece of criminal law, whether it's a new crime we don't know exactly what it means for some time. We do our best uh, to interpret it, uh, or it's a piece of criminal procedure as this uh, would be. Um, as important, um, the, the, this will create um, a lane of litigation that will cost the state and uh, municipal taxpayers hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, not for good reason necessarily, but because creating ambiguity in the ability to litigate creates uh, additional uh, apologies to the, the tort lawyers out there, but uh, uh, some of the tort system is organized extortion. And oftentimes government finds itself at the receiving end of organized extortion.
trying to create a scenario where it makes more sense to pay someone than to pay the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars it takes to litigate something. This will create that. And um, that will be a, a significant challenge for us, for taxpayers. Um, we, it'll, it'll create difficulty in training um, and it will create uh, tremendous uncertainty in the operating environment because we just, frankly, we will not know what to do. We'll take our, we'll do our best to try to interpret it. But without the courts guiding us, we won't know what's going on. So I think what we want to do is be able to provide you with the details about how much framing there is already in what the courts, both the United States Supreme Court and the Vermont Supreme Court have given us. I think that is a tremendous gap in the discussion right now. Um, can I just break in that um, we could keep you from your press conference with the governor um, and uh, probably that wouldn't go over well, but I'm, I want to just let the committee know, cause we haven't had this discussion yet. My plan for next week is to spend the bulk of our time talking about the house amendments to S-119. And I hope that you would come back with us next week and arrange with Peggy and you and perhaps the Colonel to talk further about this subject. But I've also reached out to the Just Council of State Governments Justice Center, who has a law enforcement uh, section to it, uh, a guy named Terrence Lynn, who is the head of it. I think, I think he's a former um, Boston or New York City police officer. But also, um, because the deputy director happens to live in Seattle, I'm hoping to hear something from Seattle law enforcement about how it's working there since Representative Lamont based most of the amendment on Seattle law or Seattle city policy. So I'm hoping that we spend the bulk of our time because at some point, if the house proceeds with S-119, we're gonna be asked to either agree with it, disagree with it or do something with it. And so I'm hoping that this committee can be, this Senate Judiciary Committee will be prepared to respond to that. And I've also been in corres correspondence. I haven't talked to her yet. I think I'll talk to her Sunday with Representative Grad about this subject. So just to give everyone an update on where this committee's at in looking at S-119. Thank you. And I, I just wanna be really clear we're not a no to ensuring that we are doing things absolutely the best way possible. Uh, we do have some ideas on how to execute this that we think will uh, mitigate some of the, con the, the primary concerns that we have, uh, will give us the ability to train um, and won't create a cascading set of litigation that's just frivolous um, in, for some cases. Not that every piece, I wanna also be clear, not every piece of litigation is frivolous. Uh, we make mistakes and sometimes we get sued and that makes absolute sense and we pay people. Um, luckily, not with great frequency here in Vermont. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I want to not have us in a position where we're distracted by hundreds of frivolous lawsuits as a result of an inability to, to uh, firmly interpret um, a new statutory overlay. Appreciate that. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt Senator Bruce's conversation with you, but it should probably be the final before you have to leave. But Actually, that was just my one question. We had uh, mentioned the possibility in committee yesterday of not acting on 119 and instead taking up the issue in January. I was just curious to hear your, your take on that. So that's very responsive. Thank you. You're welcome. I, j just to give you something to, to think about, um, where we see a, a short term uh, solution to this is uh, it, having the legislature direct the adoption of a statewide use of force policy that matches best practice. And in, similar to what you did with S-219, uh, couple that to an inability to get state grant dollars and also expand that to an inability to um, uh, use the state's training resources if, a, if an agency fails to adopt that model. And then we ensure that we've got the key components to solve the challenges and problems that uh, are identified by all of our communities uh, in Vermont embedded in that policy. That also makes, uh, the other challenge that I didn't mention is this kind of an operating landscape has to be able to evolve as we learn things, as new tools 
emerge as other case law in parallel to the, uh, if there were to be a statutory overlay, uh, as other case law emerges, it becomes far more difficult for us to evolve on the fly. And we're constantly changing our use of force policy as we learn more uh, to ensure that it meets the best practice. It meets the accreditation standard that the state police uh, have as an accredited agency. So again, it's not whether we go there, it's the mechanisms um, that uh, I think we've got some ideas on, on how you might accomplish the same thing without the downsides. Commissioner, um, can you and uh, Peggy uh, work, have somebody work out a time for about an hour with you and Colonel Birmingham on all these subjects next week. Absolutely, sir. I appreciate your testimony. Um, and, uh, want to make sure you get, uh, time to take a break before your press conference. I'm assuming it's a press conference with the governor. On, it is so. the, uh, the Friday press conference starts at, uh, 10 55 for us. So, okay. Well, we don't want to hold you from the press. Are, are there, is there a final question for the commissioner or Colonel Birmingham? Thank you so much. Been very helpful to discuss this. And um, I'm going to forward you a copy of Paul Doucette's email and as well as Colonel Birmingham and see if we can't get some discussion about what we can do down here. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks for your indulgence on the side road into, uh, into 119. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Colonel. Thank um, you. Can I, uh, I want to, uh, the next witness is uh, Commissioner Brown of DCF. Um, and Commissioner and I had a conversation yesterday about Woodside, but I wanted to make clear that I'm also looking at what are the alternatives to Woodside? How far along are we with the plan? Um, and so I want to just frame this a little bit, Commissioner, that um, the legislation required before the closure of Woodside to have a plan in place um, to replace Woodside with alternatives for substitute care so that these kids would be dealt with. I realize some situations have developed that has forced the closure, temp, and I'm gonna call it temporary closure of Woodside while you develop the full plan. So hopefully that frames, uh, at least from this committee's point of view, the issue of whether or not um, DO, uh, DCF um, is complying with what we asked. We also asked for a comparison of costs between Woodside and some alternative. And we're still awaiting that. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Senator. So with that, I guess I would turn it over to you. Yeah, so we did submit um, uh, a report to the legislature in mid, uh, around uh, on August 18th, um, as requested in legislation. Um, regarding our plans for Woodside. Um, as you indicated, um, a decision was made to, uh, as youth were moved from the facility and more appropriate treatment placements, we made the decision um, to close the front door based on concerns about our ability to provide the adequate and safe programming for the youth in the facility based on incidents that uh, occurred in 2018. And despite best efforts to train and, and uh, bring in new programs to the facility. Uh, similar incidents happened in late June and July um, that were very concerning and reopened the federal litigation um, that was filed last year in the US District Court of Vermont by Disability Rights Vermont. And that is still pending currently. Um, we do have an interim plan in place as we work out the details of the longer term um, a secure residential treatment program in the state of Vermont has been um, reported in the news. We are working um, with Beckett to develop and implement that in the next nine to um, uh, 12 months is our goal. Um, and I can provide you an update of where that is at currently. Um, but in the, on the interim plans, um, I would say that um, for justice involved youth who come into the system, um, historically, um, it was just an automatic assumption that those youth needed to be placed in Woodside for various reasons. And what we have learned over time 
is that that's not the case, that many of those youth can be um, um, placed in less restrictive settings that are more appropriate to their needs and risks. Um, and so that work um, is kind of what's been focusing us is what's the most appropriate placement for a youth instead of it being a default uh, of Woodside that we're really looking at um, what, where can we most appropriately place that youth? We've uh, developed crisis beds in Washington County for um, youth coming to us who might be experiencing some mental health issues. Um, we are also working with the depot <laughs> program to provide a little higher level uh, uh, of care. Um, we also have a, an interim agreement um, to place youth who come in um, depending on the hour of the evening or on a weekend. Um, to place them in a facility um, operated by the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department until we can place them in a more appropriate setting. Our agreement with them is no longer than 24 hours. And then for youth who need a longer term um, secure residential placement while we're building out um, uh, the, the program with Beckett, um, we are, are finalizing a contract with the state of New Hampshire to place up to five youth um, in their Sununu Center. Um, that agreement um, will be at a, a, a rate of just over $1,500 a day. And we will only pay that rate when we have a youth placed in that facility. Um, and we currently do have one youth there now who's scheduled to leave in the coming weeks um, at this point. Um, I, I will say, um, that given our, our proposal in, in the restatement budget to close Woodside effective October uh, 1st. Um, we have moved forward with the contractually required processes to notify BSEA um, of the reduction in force for, this, for the um, uh, staff who work there that will no longer be necessary. Uh, so uh, BSEA was notified earlier this week that 30 staff will, will receive a reduction in force notice next week after the five day period of providing that. Uh, those reduction in force um, do not take effect until uh, the third week in October. So uh, depending on the process in the legislature and where the legislature uh, supports our proposal, uh, if not, we are able to retract uh, those reduction in force notices uh, before they take effect in October. But just given the, the way the contract, it requires certain timeframes and notices to occur, we needed to start that process now to be able to achieve uh, the savings in the budget that we contemplate by winding the program down at Woodside. Um, currently staff are, um, uh, you know, cleaning the facility um, and, um, you know, storing records and, and um, winding down the program right now. Um, it you know, depending on where the legislature goes, um, we'll have to have a conversation. We don't believe that we can safely reopen that facility in current circumstances. Um, you know, we are uh, heading back to federal court um, uh, in a, next week. Um, to, and, you know, we'll see where the federal court is gonna go with that. Uh, but based on the incidents, um, we could be at risk of the federal court um, ordering the closure of the facility as well. Um, and so that, that could be a risk here um, that we should be aware of as well. And so our, uh, if there's any questions, so our budget in the restatement um, really breaks down our, our spending. Um, instead of the 6 million or so that we normally um, request for Woodside, we're asking for $4.6 million. Um, just under 1.5 of that would be uh, for the operation of the facility for the first quarter of 21. That would be through the end of September. Um, uh, just over 1,500 of that would be for, uh, you know, uh, placements of youth that would uh, need the level of care or uh, that Woodside would provide. Um, and then 1.1 would be new cost for the uh, program that we're working to establish with Beckett. And then just under 500,000 for miscellaneous grants and contracts. Um, we are uh, consulting with uh, several national organizations as we move through this process. Um, and so when you, look at that, and this is broken out in our, our report, our Woodside report that we filed in mid-August. Um, it's just over $4.6 million is, is uh, what we're requesting 
um, uh, to care for uh, justice involved youth. Hi. Is there any? God. Just as a beginning question, Commissioner, um, where are we at in the Beckett, the, in the process of the Beckett contract and it being Medicaid eligible? So um, I'm understanding the Sununu would not be Medicaid eligible. Correct. Today, correct? And correct. I think. How we're approaching uh, our work with Beckett is that um, there's there's the facilities piece, and then there's the programming piece that we're developing with them. And I think how that uh, programming piece is developed will will answer the question once that's further along whether that will be Medicaid eligible or not. Currently, the uh, the current um, budget for Woodside doesn't contemplate the use of Medicaid. I know historically. Um, that was the case, but uh, given uh, CMS's, um, uh, you know, guidance, we're not able to do utilize that currently for Woodside, and so that's currently not in the budget nor in our request for 21. But certainly, uh, our goal is as we develop uh, this treatment program um, that we would design it and, and implement it in a way that it will be Medicaid eligible. But we won't know that answer until we do more of the work with Beckett. On, on the programming side. Okay. Um, what about other programs within the, by the way, the, the agenda item said, and I didn't catch it, it's my fault, um, substitutions, um, it was really <laughs> substitute care. Yeah. Um, any plans in terms of other programs within, either for upgrades or whatever, within the substitute care uh, grouping? Yeah, we, we do utilize a variety of uh, programs um, out of state and in state for youth. And some of those uh, may be Medicaid eligible and others may not, depending on the nature of the program and the services being provided. Um, and I would let uh, Sarah Truckle jump in here as well uh, to provide a little additional information. Yeah, so Sarah Truckle, DCF Financial Director for the record, uh, our substitute care programs do leverage Medicaid dollars in many cases for um, their treatment services. However, they do not leverage Medicaid dollars for the room and board expenses. And that's outlined in our um, FY21 Gov original submission. You can see um, some of the movement within those lines based on cost per case and um, average case and our expected and projected caseload for this coming year. So, so for some of the youth that might have ended up in Woodside that we're placing in other treatment programs, um, depending on the program, we would be able to draw down Medicaid for the treatment, but not the room and board. And what it, about it's, on, it's, the, yeah. on the detention side? Um, it, you know, we, we really... You know, Sununu is the true detention pro program where we're placing kids and, and that is not Medicaid eligible. But the other programs, while they may be secure, they are treatment programs and the treatment portion um, and many of those could be and probably are Medicaid eligible. Um, but it, it you know, depends on the specific program they're in and whether they've been Medicaid approved. And uh, it, it, it is a complicated process, but many of them are Medicaid eligible. Has there been any discussion with Beckett about hiring some of the state employees or having state employees work for Beckett? I know there was a discussion about a 10 bed Woodside facility that would be operated by a private provider, but um, there was, there is, there are some examples, Senator White may know more about it than I do, where um, we have state employees working for a private um, group. Um, I think prison healthcare at one time was like that, but has there any been, I, I thought there was a discussion about having a five bed mental health unit and a five bed, um, lack of a better term, uh, treatment program for uh, the youth that are currently, that would currently be going to Sununu. Mm -hmm. um, could you clarify, uh, uh, are you referring to um, well, the, at one point you talked about back in when the um, 
It may have been Commissioner Schatz, by the way, and not you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to put that on to you. <laughs> um, there was a discussion between mental health and DCF. You have, prior to the uh, Crawford decision um, regarding Woodside and the use of Woodside for seriously emotionally um, problem youth, there was a discussion about having a combined 10 bed type program at Woodside, <clears throat> which would either, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but there was that discussion and five of those would be mental health beds and five of them would be DCF beds that would handle the traditional um, uh, current Woodside or now Sununu group. And um, that was the discussion anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my understanding is that, that while that wasn't an, a, a conversation and, and a discussion, whether that made sense, I believe that plan um, uh, was abandoned prior to my coming on board. Um, and so our focus has been um, standing up a, a a five bed secure residential treatment program is what we believe is the size we need, um, you know, for, for the kids that need that higher level of care. Um, you know, we're really seeing a drop in the number of kids coming into the system, but also kids that would need that, that level of care that we're able to provide other treatment for them in less restrictive settings. And that's always our goal is to have kids receive services in the least restrictive setting possible. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question that, um, you may not be able to fully answer, but um, from free field to say because of confidentiality, I can't. But you had at one point, we discussed at least five staff members at Woodside out on paid administrative leave. Then we know that the current Woodside staff received uh, a RIF notices. We had put into language at some point um, the... Um, the idea of helping those staff to integrate into other places where their talents, their skills could be used, whether it be mental health corrections, et cetera, um, or DCF locally. Mm -hmm. What will happen to those that are on paid administrative leave? What, are they rift too, or do they remain on paid administrative leave pending the investigation? And I don't know what the number is now. I know at one point it was five. Or are they also rift? Sure. So I, I, I'll step back a little bit and maybe provide a little bit of a context for, I think, my response to your question, Senator. Um, Woodside has approximately 48 to, to 50 uh, positions uh, to run the facility. Um, and Sarah Truckle, please jump in if I misspeak here. Um, approximately 20 of those are vacant positions. Um, and, a pro and 30 are currently filled. Of the 30 filled positions, 11 of those staff are under investigation for misconduct. And, um, and I believe seven are, are on relief from duty pending those investigations and, and um, at this time. So those staff will receive a reduction in force notice. Um, our goal is, is that those investigations it should be resolved prior uh, to when the final um, a reduction in force takes place. Um, you know, depending on the outcome, those staff would be, my understanding and talking to HR, is those staff uh, would be eligible uh, uh, for placement in other positions. Um, our goal is for, for staff, um, you know, that are still with us after those processes that, um, you know, we had conversations with the Secretary of Human Services and we're, we are comfortable um, and, and would provide a preference to all Woodside staff for all vacant positions they may be qualified that are open for recruitment across the agency with the goal that we would be able to find um, a job that suits their education and skill set within the Agency of Human Services. Um, however, I would, to answer your prior question regarding Beckett, um, 
they are interested if, if um, in employing state employees to uh, in, in this program, if they would want to join the Beckett uh, organization to, to help um, uh, run this five bed uh, uh, community-based secure residential program that we're working on standing up. And so our hope is, is that the, all of the Woodside employees will have, will be still employees of the Agency of Human Services um, when the process is all said and done. Um, just a quick read of that. Of the 30 filled positions, 11, it's like 35% are on paid administrative leave. Did that have something to do with the closure? Yeah, we, uh, to be honest, um, we That's were, an amazing number. It, it, it is a high number and it's a concerning number. Um, and, it, and, and there was a couple of other factors that played into the closure, closure decision. Um, and that was one of them. We were starting, when you look at staff who are on relief from duty and then uh, staff who are out on other leave, we were starting to not be able to staff the facility. Um, also I, I, to be transparent for the, for the committee, um, Another factor that went into our, our decision making um, when I came on board um, on June 29th as commissioner, um, we had five youth at the facility at the time. Um, three of those youth were of color. And I found that um, shocking given, given Vermont's demographics. And I was incredibly concerned um, uh, about the impact that Woodside is having on youth of color and the rate and the racial injustice involved there. Um, and I was concerned about uh, Woodside playing a continuing role in that system. And so, uh, and I think if you look back in the history of Woodside, um, youth of color have been disproportionately representative of the youth placed at that facility. Uh, and I think that speaks to the broader uh, juvenile justice system in general. Um, but uh, um, that was pretty shocking to me as well and concerning. Okay. Other questions for Commissioner Brown or for Sarah? I, I don't know where, where it ends. I'm prepared to say that um, I don't know. What did the Human Services Committee in the House. I understood that they took a vote. That they did, they, they voted uh, ten to nothing in favor of closing Woodside effective October first. Okay, I am reluctant to join them because I still really want. I, I mean, I understand there's nobody there and nobody's working there, mm -hmm. so effectively it's closed. But I still think. And I, I want to hear from the rest of the committee, but I still think we're in need of an actual plan before we jump in. Um, Representative, a Senator, Nick here and myself both worked in the industry. I'll call it the industry. And over the years, we've seen attempts at changing um, different programs and having these solutions. And oftentimes, um, they don't work out. Um, and I don't want to, well, I, I mean, I'm ready to say the short-term closure of Woodside is realistic and has to be done. But I'm not ready to say that the plan is in place yet to fully um, move our juvenile justice system in a new direction. Uh, and Senator, I well, I'm sorry. Does that make sense, committee? I, I, I don't know where others are at, but I just, without knowing exactly how Beckett's going to operate, what it's going to have, what the other factors are in, I, um, the contract with Sununu, the contract with um, uh, Lamoille County Sheriff's, all of those factors seem short-term solutions to me, which I think are appropriate given this current situation. Senator Baruth. I would just note, I agree with you, and I would just note that the last time uh, there was an attempt to move people out of Woodside, it was unsuccessful uh, originally. So, um, you know, and then there was scrambling to figure out a place. So it seems like having a plan 
before a permanent move is not not a crazy idea. Right. What what is the time frame for getting something in place with Beckett? I mean, is there a firm date or? Um, one of the things we're, we're waiting on, um, and uh, we had a site visit yesterday at the facility they're proposing uh, for this new secure residential treatment program, uh, was architects and structural engineers assessment of one, whether it was feasible to retrofit uh, this, this um, which is a pretty nice facility uh, to upgrade it to be a secure residential. And so we had a site visit yesterday um, with the Beckett team uh, the DCF team and um, architects and engineers from uh, a White River firm. Um, and they gave us the thumbs up that it's possible. We are, uh, they are gonna provide us, uh, uh, you know, those details and the technical drawings to, to, to do that work so that we can hire a contractor and move forward with those um, uh, renovations to that facility to bring it up to the secure standards that we need. Okay. Um, our so, goal is nine to 12 months. I can tell you that we are finalizing a letter of intent um, to move forward uh, with Beckett. We, we've agreed in principle, we just need to execute it. We're also uh, negotiating um, what I would call a development agreement, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to build this program, to then set the table for us to enter into a contract to run the, for them to run the program. Um, we're talking about governance structures right now. They would like, a, 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 like to run it like a, with a nonprofit board, which we think we support. Uh, they want a broader community participation in the running of, of this program. And we think that that's a good idea. Um, and we support that. Um, well, can, can I just ask something else? First of all, um, would it be a no refusal? Uh, yes. Ability? Yes, it would be no, 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 no reject, no eject as how we informally would say that. Yes. And so that's as part of the contract, you're getting that in. Yeah, that, that is a piece of the letter of intent so that everyone understands that that's a piece of moving forward with this is that this is that type of facility. I see. Yes. That's good. I mean, I think the worry uh, on my part is many times of uh, when there wasn't a place to go, you either spend the night social worker spends the night in the police station in the room, or you have the child in your office overnight, or of course there are the motels. So, you know, just really I like the idea of no refusal, even though you could be, I guess the hard part is if you become full and then you have to move somebody out who is in less of a difficult position and, and get the, her, the child on the outside in. And also, are you free to say where it would be, what town? Um, we're still, uh, given the negotiations, uh, we've committed to Beckett not to announce that yet. They okay. need to engage the community. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, oh, and you, you started your job on June 29th and you got handed this hot potato and I, I appreciate your your work on this and the, and the difficulty that you and your staff have had. Um, does this mean that we get Beth Sawsville back in Bennington? Yes, it does. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, I don't know that we need a formal motion the way that the, um, the House Human Services Committee did, but I think that it would be the sense of the committee that um, we approve of the temporary plan. We await further information on a permanent plan for these kids. And uh, you know, I've been dating myself all day that, today, but I do remember um, when Woodside first opened, um, it was actually at the Vermont State Hospital and one of the I'll refer to as a dungeon and visiting there, I couldn't believe that we were actually, and this was in the seventies, I think, Alice. Um, I was there. We were actually putting kids in this place. Um, yeah. And so as people look at Woodside and how horrible it might be today, um, it, you, you looked at that facility and oh my God, I think there were eight kids there um, or eight beds. Um, and it, 
it truly was. Um, I mean, it was, it looked like the rest of the state hospital. Yeah. Well, it was even, I remember having to go through tunnels to get to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, hopefully this plan will work out. I do feel bad um, for the staff who have done some exemplary work with kids, many of them that I worked with back when I was operating 204 Depot in Bennington, um, who are really good people, dedicated uh, professionals, and I hope they're able to uh, seamlessly move. I don't have a lot of sympathy for some of the staff who have been placed on administrative leave because of um, their own difficulties, but I do have, and I do know there are a lot of good people there. Um, so my hope is that um, we can help them. Senator Nitke, then Senator White or White Nitke, I don't care. With regard to the staff that are <coughs> the RIF happening when that happens, um, are are majority of them eligible to move into social worker positions? I mean, do they have those qualifications generally? You know, I haven't gotten to that level of detail of their backgrounds, but that's certainly one of the job classes that we have always have a lot of availability of. You know, similar to in economic services, we have a lot of benefits right. program specialists. I know we have uh, many former Woodside staff in those positions in economic services, just be given it's, it, it, it is a, a transferable human services background that works there. So, Thank you. Thank you. Senator White. So I just, in general, have um, problems with us uh, privatizing things that have been state functions in the past. And I wondered by, so that's, that's just a general feeling of mine about most of the things that we do. So have you, did you have to um, go through the privatization um, rigor here around the savings and why it's best to do it this way as opposed to have it be a state function? I certainly appreciate the question. I, I think the, the there's a couple of ways we view this. Um, one is we don't believe we're privatizing the current function of Woodside. Woodside has been, while it's tried to be a treatment program, it's really been operated as a detention program in reality. And we, and we are building a, a residential treatment program. So we're not really uh, privatizing it. I think we're recognizing the state's not able to run a treatment program. So it's not privatizing it. It's actually contracting for a, a different service, just as we uh, do other, you know, we, we use, we have 125 youth currently placed in treatment programs through family services. Some of those are justice involved youth and some of those, um, are, are through the child protection side of, of our house as well. And so we already use a wide variety of community programs to provide services. We've just um, always had this facility over here. And if you read the sign, it does say detention facility on it. And that's how it operated for most of its history. We're really trying to build a treatment program for these youth to make sure we're meeting their, new, their needs and preparing them uh, for adulthood. Okay. So I, I forgot to mention one thing about the about the um, original. It wasn't called Woodside, but the one at the state hospital it was actually operated by Washington County Mental Health and not the state of Vermont. It was just housed, I believe, at the state facility, and there may or may not have been state employees. Joe, Dick, I hate to cut off this conversation, but I think we're going to be having it again in the not too distant future. Uh, unfortunately, we're on the floor in 10 minutes and I need to go find my jacket. Um, are we going to take a vote here or are we? I think I have the sense of the committee and unless somebody objects to the idea that um, we're approving a temporary closure and um, awaiting a permanent plan. That would be my recommendation to the Senate Appropriations Committee. Okay. Okay. Or our rec I should say our recommendation, not my recommendation, but our committee's recommendation is a temporary. And all of us need to put our ties on and jackets. And so I appreciate Sarah and uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that ends the meeting.